Uh, for those of you who don't know me on this call, my name is Lisa Smith, and I'm the Chief Program Officer here at the Network of Jewish Human Service Agencies. And I want to welcome everyone um, from the East Coast, the West Coast. Um, potentially, we have some of our members in Canada and Israel, so I want to make sure that uh, we welcome you as well. Uh, thank you for joining um, this webinar, The Impact of Culturally Competent Cancer Care. This training webinar, of course, is sponsored by Shar Sherat. Thank you so much. And as part of the NJHSA Vision 2020 conference that we couldn't have, as you all know, back in Atlanta, we're doing uh, webinars and these are part of them. So uh, before we begin, I want to go over some housekeeping details. This webinar is being recorded for future viewing. However, uh, please note that in order to receive your CE credit, you have to attend the live webinar. Um, and this afternoon, right after this, a little bit after, you'll be emailed information on how to apply for your CE credit, as well as an evaluation for today's training. Um, it, Everyone already has because we're all Zoom experts now. Uh, please keep yourself on mute throughout the presentation. Um, if you have questions, please um, type them into the chat box, which I will be monitoring. And we will, um, be, these questions will be asked throughout the whole webinar. We're gonna be stopping at different points in time. Um, and any questions that aren't answered during today's webinar will of course be answered by Melissa um, in the next few days just in case. Uh, we recommend to keep your screen on speaker view so you can see the um, you know, slides more clearly and um, it can be accessed on the top right hand of your screen. And lastly, for those of you who may be confused or not, this webinar is going to end at two o'clock, not three o'clock um, as suggested by the registration. So with all that being said, I want to introduce Melissa K. Rosen. She is the Director of Community Education at Char Sherritt. And over the years that I've been at NJHSA, she's been a wonderful partner and a great friend to us. And um, it's always enjoyable talking with her. She holds a master's degree in Jewish communal service from Brandeis University and has been working in the nonprofit sector for over 30 years. Her professional experience includes informal education and programming, advocacy, and community outreach. Melissa oversees community education and training throughout the country, training healthcare professionals, Jewish professionals, and Sharsharit volunteers. She also manages the Sharsharit Community Partners Program. Herself a breast cancer survivor, she is passionate about the Jewish community and cancer support and advocacy. And before I hand it over to her, I neglected to say something very important about this specific webinar. It's also presented in collaboration with Sharsharit's cooperative agreement with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. So with all of that, Melissa, take it away. Thank you so much, Lisa. And, and thank you. It is always a pleasure to work with your team and the organizations that are members of the network. So today, I wanted to, you, to share with you what we're going to be talking about. The primary goal is so that participants will understand why culturally competent cancer care is truly important and the impact it has. We'll discuss that through the example of a Jewish woman facing breast cancer, but I'll also take time to point out where things are relevant or with a little tweak, they might be relevant to other communities as I know many of us work well beyond the Jewish community. We're gonna talk about how your agencies and organizations will be able to help. And I'll introduce you to Shar Sheret's resources if you're unfamiliar. Okay, a quick overview. Shar Sheret is a national nonprofit organization we support women and, and their families impacted by breast or ovarian cancer or by genetic high, heightened risk. Um, and we also educate the general community about that heightened risk. We provide all sorts of programs in a culturally meaningful way. 
And we do that during all stages, either before someone is diagnosed, but they're concerned about it during the diagnostic process, treatment, metastatic disease or survivorship. Um, and although our, our programs, although our programs really have a specialty in the Jewish community and we're the only organization um, in North America that does that, the reality is that we don't have a religious agenda and our programs are open to absolutely everyone. In fact, about a quarter of our callers have no connection to the Jewish community. We share that expertise through training such as this, community education programs, psychosocial support and patient education, as well as educational resources. I want to take a second to talk about cultural competence. With the field that you're all in, even within those variations, I am sure all of you understand what it is. But the bottom line is that we need to see our clients, our members, our patients, however we define them for the organization we work with, not as a diagnosis, but as a person as a whole. And that's incredibly important. And the reason we do that is because study after study has shown that patients, any patients, we're talking about not just cancer, but anybody going through a difficult situation, a difficult medical situation, patients whose non-medical needs are met have better medical outcomes. So for someone facing breast cancer, that might mean they get through treatment with fewer complications, because as we know, treatment is difficult. They, they survive, not just survive, but thrive in greater numbers. So to frame this, I really want to say this isn't just a nice thing we're doing, making somebody's life a little bit easier when we're assisting somebody, supporting somebody who's facing cancer or another diagnosis. This actually impacts outcome, and that is incredibly important. Now, when we think about non-medical needs, very often our, our first thoughts are to, um, to finances or childcare, and those are important needs. But what people often forget is religion and culture also fall into the category of non-medical needs. And that's incredibly important because when we meet people's non-medical needs, we're helping to reduce their stress load. And we know from many studies that high levels of stress can lead not just to depression and lower quality of life, negative health behaviors, but also lower immunity and faster disease progression. And that's why meeting non-medical needs actually um, improves the medical outcome. So what we're talking about today is truly significant if you're working with um, those facing illness. And I just wanna point out, I know we have people here from family service organizations and synagogues and JCCs and cancer support organizations. So when I say patients or clients, it could be somebody you're seeing in a therapeutic way. It could be someone you might be seeing in a medical way, although that's unlikely in this particular training. It could be a member of your community, right? It could be a member and someone you're, you're working with in that way. And, and so really this information impacts everybody on this, this training webinar, even if you don't directly work with people um, who are dealing with a cancer diagnosis. Okay, I always like to start um, the part about um, the cultural nuances with this slide. On the picture here, you see just a few ways that people can define themselves as Jewish. On the side of the slide, you see in alphabetical order, just a few of the, the titles that people might take on when they consider themselves Jewish. And I, I like to show this as a reminder because whether the people I'm training on a particular day are Jewish, have connections to the Jewish community, aren't familiar with the Jewish community, often, whether we realize it or not, we have in our mind uh, the way we think about different types of people. And this slide reminds, whether it's, oh, I'm Jewish, that person's Jewish, they must be Jewish like me, or 
you know, I, I know someone who's Jewish, so the person sitting in front of me must be Jewish like them. And that is just clearly not the case. The interesting part about this is that you could conceivably have two women you're working with, both facing a similar diagnosis and have needs they relate to their Jewish identity, but to you may actually seem diametrically opposed. Uh, which I, I find fascinating. And somebody once asked me an example, so let me share an example with you. So you could have two women who are going through radiation treatment, which is a daily thing, usually at the same time, every day, five days a week. Um, you might have an Orthodox woman who's getting treatment during the winter, who says, you know, I need an earlier appointment because I need to be back home on Fridays before 4 p.m. And um, that's incredibly important to me. That's going to allow this to work for me. You might have someone who, um, who celebrates Shabbat but doesn't observe it in a traditional way, um, either someone associated with a different movement or on their own. And, and she says to the scheduling person, I need, I need a late afternoon appointment because I can't leave work too early. But even on Friday, if I'm home by six o'clock, I have time to feed my family dinner before we go to temple on Friday night. So two different needs, both for Jewish reasons. And, and so that's so incredibly important to keep in mind that everybody is an individual. A lot of people ask why we need a Jewish organization. There are so many amazing cancer organizations out there, and I'm sure you're familiar with, with some of them. But the reason Sharsher was created almost 20 years ago was really twofold. Um, one, those of Ashkenazi or Eastern European Jewish descent um, have a hereditary predisposition to um, certain mutations that raise the risk of a cancer diagnosis. We have a lot of studies on that population, but there are, um, there's reason to believe that um, similar things may be true for other Jewish populations, Sephardi, Mizrahi, and then also everybody deserves culturally meaningful support for the reasons that we've already spoken about. Let's start with the genetics part of it. Um, first, because it's more tangible and, and because there are so many myths and so much misinformation out there that I want you guys to understand the basics so that you can um, share that information. So listen, if we took um, one state, I happen to sit in, in New Jersey, so let's take New Jersey as an example. If we took all people in New Jersey, men, women, people from different ethnic backgrounds, different religious beliefs, one in about 500 to 800 of those people would carry a mutation on their BRCA gene, one in 500 to 800. For those of Eastern European or Ashkenazi Jewish descent, that number is one in 40. That is a staggering difference. And if you carry, first of all, let me point out, hereditary breast cancer diagnoses are a small percentage of all breast cancer diagnoses, maybe somewhere between five to 15%. And um, so it is a small number, but if you carry one of those mutations, your risk is significantly higher. So up to as much as an 88% lifetime risk of breast cancer compared to about 12% in the general population. And as much as 45% risk for ovarian cancer compared to less than 2% in the general population. So clearly this population need, needs to be educated differently because their risks are different. And because of that, the actions they take to be proactive about their health should be different. By the way, it's not just the Ashkenazi Jewish population that, that um, carries this, this risk. There are other populations. I just learned yesterday um, that the population that um, lives or comes from the Caribbean carries a heightened risk. Um, I know that there is an island off of Italy that has been very self-contained for generations. They have a heightened risk. I've been told that the Inuit population carries a heightened risk. So it's not just um, this the Jewish population. 
You know, every time Angelina Jolie, and we're talking many years ago already, had surgery, we would get an uptick in calls. People wanting to know what BRCA was, what their options were, should they get screened? Um, and it led to, I mean, she did a real service to this topic and it led to quite a bit of increase in screening. The second surgery, she prophylactic or preventative surgery she had, she changed her messaging a little bit to talk about her children and how she wanted her children. She was having the surgery because she wanted her children to know she had done absolutely everything she could to be there for them. And that very much resonated with some people, but with others it did not. And they would call and say, you know, I know I'm at heightened risk, but I'm not going to have that screening because I would never remove a healthy body part. And so we spent a lot of time educating people that year that you don't have to learn that you carry a BRCA mutation and go right to prophylactic surgery. There are many things that can be done, including active surveillance, right? If you know you're at heightened risk, you might start screening earlier. You might screen more frequently. You might screen differently with different screening modalities, not just a mammogram, but maybe an MRI or a sonogram as well. And if you know what your mutation status is, it will be a much easier conversation with your insurance company. You could choose healthy living, right? We all should be living healthfully, but it's not always easy and we don't always move as much as we should or eat all the right foods. But if you know you're already at heightened risk, that might be just the push someone needs to really commit to healthy living behaviors, which whether you carry a mutation or not, actually reduce risk significantly. For some women, chemo prevention might be an option. Taking a drug such as tamoxifen prior to a diagnosis to, risk, to reduce risk. And of course, prophylactic surgeries are an option. However, usually, and this is a conversation one would have with their doctor, usually um, it's not an emergency. It doesn't have to be done immediately. It can be done at, perhaps after someone builds their family, things like that. The final thing I want to talk about in terms of options for living with a mutation is something called PGD, or now they're switching it from diagnosis to screening. And that's not to do with the person themselves, but creating a family. And I want to share with you a very brief video of one of our callers who went through this. Oops, let me go back and try one more time. My daughter, She's nine years old. She's the first child born in the world to have been screened for the BRCA gene as an embryo. So we know she doesn't have BRCA because we didn't put any BRCA positive embryos in. We found 10 years ago the one geneticist in the world who was doing screening on embryos for the BRCA gene. And he agreed to screen my embryos for the BRCA gene. For me, I made the choices that I made because I had been through cancer. I'd watched my mother die from cancer and I was not passing it on if I could avoid it. I was gonna do everything in my power to do that. And so we did IVF, a cell was removed from each embryo and they were sent to a lab in Detroit and, and they were biopsied to find out which embryos had the BRCA gene. And then the embryologist selected the ones that didn't have the gene and implanted those. So that's how my kids were born through IVF. But when I did it, you know, I asked my doctors about it and they looked at me like I was speaking Greek. They didn't know what I was talking about. Their concern isn't long term making you a family. They're, you know, they really just want to keep you alive. I was concerned about being alive and having a family. So I had to navigate that myself. Now, Sharsharat does that. So I speak with a lot of young women who are going through cancer treatment and are concerned about preserving their fertility and also women who have BRCA or suspect they have BRCA and want to know what they can do to avoid passing that along because if I have children will I give this horrible thing to them and there is the technology to avoid doing that now. For me it gives me a lot of comfort to know that my girls don't have the gene, that their risk of breast cancer is the same as any other woman on the street because my risk was 88%. What I'm saying to you is you can change your future. So that's a very hopeful message for many families. The, the process she went through, 
that was already 10 years ago, so it's gotten much more common. It's still not standard of care necessarily, but it's definitely something that people can consider. Now, before we move on to the next topic, I just want to say that despite the fact that um, the genetics of the situation um, is far more commonly known than it was even a couple of years ago, there is still so much misinformation out there so many myths and i want to share a couple with you because for sure if you are working with any this population in any way you may hear them so the first is simply you may have heard someone say i have BRCA." so here's the deal each of us has two brca or yes two brca or BRCA genes the purpose of those genes is to fix any minor um, problems with our, ge our genetics, any, any spontaneous mutations, and to help suppress excess uh, cell growth, which is in fact what cancer is. So each of us has two of these genes. They are not the problem. The problem is when they are not functioning properly. And it's not just BRCA, by the way. Um, we, there are other genes we know that impact risk. Cal B2, CHECK2, ATM, Lynch, and um, they don't raise risk at quite the rate, and they don't, they aren't quite as common, which is why you hear about BRCA um, the most. I, it makes me so upset when we get a, a, a caller who, who is facing a diagnosis and we'll hear them say, but my doctor said I didn't need um, genetic screening because all the cancer was on my paternal side. So let me just be very clear. BRCA mutations are not just a woman's mutation. Men and women carry BRCA mutations in equal numbers and can pass it down to male or female children in equal numbers. And that's incredibly important to keep in mind. Um, you should know that um, it's, not just, it's not just breast and ovarian cancer also, we've learned recently. Now we know that men aren't getting ovarian cancer, but there is such a thing as male breast cancer and um, having a BRCA mutation um, raises one's risk for getting that. But it also raises risk for melanoma, for pancreatic cancer, and for prostate cancer. So we need to keep all of these in mind, it affects men and women. And the other thing is, you know, as a Jewish community specifically, we've done a great job of educating about Tay-Sachs. Um, Tay-Sachs, for anyone who doesn't know, is a childhood wasting disease, a very horrible disease. Um, we've done a great job of educating about it and reducing um, occurrence dramatically. However, because we've educated so well about that, people don't always realize that there are, there's more than one type of mutation. So while Tay-Sex is a recessive mutation, which means both parents need to carry the mutation and pass it down at the same time for a child to be impacted, BRCA is a dominant mutation, which means that uh, only one parent needs to carry it and they will pass it down 50% of the time. Um, and and um, that a carrier can be medically impacted themselves. So very important to keep in mind. Now we're gonna take a shift here and talk more about the cultural aspects of it. But before I do, I wanna see the genetics is something that not a lot of people are familiar with. Are there any questions? We'll give it a second. Please type it into to the chat box and Lisa from the network will will um, answer the questions and, or will share the questions. You can ask them later if you haven't thought of one yet, but I just want to give a moment to see if there are any questions specifically about the genetic aspect of this. Okay, it doesn't seem like anyone has a question. Okay, so we're gonna move on to something that may be more familiar to you already. But again, if you have any questions about the genetics, just type it in and we'll answer them during the next pause. Okay, so um, a, lot of, a lot of people uh, who have a cancer or are facing a cancer diagnosis 
are dealing with very common stressors. As you can imagine, any illness causes stress. Cancer is a, a very scary diagnosis. So some of the more common stressors include uncertainty about the fu future, of course. Will my treatment be effective? Will I have a reoccurrence? Um, there's also concern about pain and side effects from the treatment, both short-term and long-term. Um, will I be sick from chemotherapy? Will my hair fall out? Or something, will, will brain fog last for a while? Will my fertility be impacted? Um, there are some practical things like finances and health insurance, transportation and scheduling issues. But I think one of the most important things for us as professionals within social service agencies and the Jewish community to keep in mind is social isolation. Really um, hearing that what, receiving a diagnosis is isolating off the bat. All of a sudden you're thinking about uh, different things than your friends and community are thinking about. You're, you have a disruption to your normal schedule. You may not be going to work to see people there. You may not, um, you may not be going to synagogue or church because you're immunocompromised. You may not be leaving the house because there's a pandemic going on. There are a, a lot of things that disrupt your normal schedule and, and enhance um, or strengthen, unfortunately, a sense of isolation, which can be problematic as we heal both from a physical and a psychosocial perspective. And of course, there's always a fear or resistance to asking for help. Um, <clears throat> as, as adults, we tend to say, no, I'm fine, I'm fine, I don't need anything, thank you, no, nope, I'm good. Um, we wanna offer help to others, but we don't often accept that. And that can sometimes be problematic. But there are also culturally specific concerns. Look, in any, <clears throat> in any minority community, dating and marriage tends to to be something important. Um, whether, whether you are a, a very, a, whatever the case is, dating and marriage is very often, excuse me, very important. Um, fertility or infertility. And by the way, this is whether you have already have children or you don't. Fertility is very often a concern. Um, interestingly enough, I hear that frequently women facing a cancer diagnosis are told by people, people they're doctors, people they're social workers, people they're neighbors, people you know who have no business necessarily talking about this, will often offer as a source of comfort, oh, you already have a child, thank goodness, you know, just focus on being alive for that child and not taking in, into account that somebody may have wanted additional children, that in certain communities, large families are the norm. Within the Jewish community, that's um, the, the Orthodox or ultra-Orthodox. There are other communities too um, that have nothing to do with Judaism that where large families are the norm. So it doesn't matter whether you had only wanted to have one child or, or you had wanted to have as many children as you possibly could have had. Um, uh, you know, the, each one a gift. It is never okay to, to, to comment on somebody. And by the way, in some of those communities, having a small family is a tip off to other people you may not have shared your diagnosis with that something is wrong, whether it's infertility, a cancer diagnosis, any number of things that you might want, not want your neighbors to know. There's questions, I'm sort of jumping around the slide, but there's questions about communal disclosure. Um, and Listen, I, I, Lisa mentioned that I'm a cancer survivor. I can tell you myself that, um, that the community was wonderful. And along with all the amazing support came people asking my children how I was and people sharing um, really sad stories about their own friends and relatives and people sharing um, cures that they've heard about that really were not founded in, in um, medicine. And so everybody sort of has to make a cost benefit analysis. Are they going to share with their community and get that wonderful source of support? Or are they going to keep it to themselves because they don't want some of the things that go around, come around when you share? So keep in mind that the person you're talking with, whether in a casual or a professional way, may have only chosen you to share, and you may be their sole source of, of support. 
Um, also, I want to talk about hair covering. I want to talk about hair covering because it is the perfect example of the importance of culturally competent cancer care in, you know, across the board in any community. So obviously hair loss is a big concern for those going through chemotherapy. And very frequently, just like the fertility comments, people will say, oh, you'll just get a wig. They're so beautiful now, nobody will ever know the difference. But imagine you grew up in a community where wig wearing after marriage was the norm. And you've always associated it with a joyous um, occasion. You were looking forward to putting on a wig the, the day of your wedding. And, and, and so all of a sudden it's being associated with something completely different and not in fact joyous. And that um, can feel very emotionally debilitating. Furthermore, if you come from a community where that is a norm, I do not care how beautiful the wig is, people will recognize it as a wig. And instead of hearing, I'm sorry, I just heard, how can I help? You're hearing, congratulations, mazel tov, I didn't know. And that puts, of course, the patient in a very awkward position. But if you're familiar with the culture of, of the person you are working with, then you might know that and you wouldn't make a comment like that. And you might offer different suggestions to get around that discomfort with covering your hair for a reason other than marriage. Okay, we talked about community support. Let's talk about spirituality for a second. Whether the person you are assisting is Jewish, Muslim, Christian, of another faith entirely. What we find is that people diagnosed with cancer are very often looking for meaning, meaning in their diagnosis. And I want to um, just point out that for some that means seeking a Jewish or other faith connection, but that seeking that connection means something completely different to everyone. For some it's spending more time in nature, meditating, doing yoga. For others, it's taking on additional religious observance. It's reciting um, psalms or tehillim in Hebrew. It is making sure you're at church or synagogue or the mosque every time you should be. There's another aspect there. there there's another aspect I want people to be aware of. Uh, nobody in America today needs to be religious. So if you are, if you count yourself religious, it means you're receiving positive things from it. Um, and so there are some people who upon diagnosis are so angry, they back away from their faith community. They back away from God if they have a relationship with God. And that's really a shame simply because um, if it brought them comfort before, certainly they want all sources of comfort they can get during uh, a cancer experience. The last thing I want to mention on this slide is holiday preparation. It doesn't seem like it fits in this slide, but here's why it does. Very often we've found that holiday preparation is a trigger for the women that call us. They may be doing very well um, medically, they may still go to work, they may still be caring for their family, and all of a sudden something comes along that stops them in their tracks. And an example I can share with you from Char Sherritt is a woman, a young woman who was in the middle of her diet, her treatment for breast cancer, had two small children, was still their primary caregiver, and uh, still going to work, doing very well medically. She woke up one morning at the end of March and couldn't get herself out of bed. So her husband, her partner, brought her to the doctor, the oncologist, who did a physical exam and could find no reason for her change in status. She happened to have a call scheduled with one of our clinicians later that day and was telling her what was going on. And after talking for a little bit, our social worker said, what are you doing for Passover this year? And she thought about it and her response was, oh my goodness, this is the first time in a decade I'm not hosting a Seder. That was her aha, I really am ill moment. She was doing so well that it was almost like her treatment was a check off on her to-do list. And this was the time that she was forced to confront the fact that she was ill and couldn't do everything she once did. And so we worked with her and her friends and family who prepared her home, who cooked, who set the table, who served 
who cleaned up so the Seder could be at her home. It wasn't exactly the same, but it was enough to, to make it feel comfortable for her. And by the way, we're not just talking about Passover here. The same could be true for Christmas or Thanksgiving, for a bar or bat mitzvah, for, the, um, for a graduation or an anniversary. Sometimes unexpected things are triggers. I want to talk for a second about the role of rabbis and community professionals. Most of the time they have limited medical knowledge, but what they can offer is spiritual or where appropriate Jewish legal guidance. Um, and they can also help limit the isolation of the patient, help meet their physical needs, their non-medical needs. And by the way, this is needed even more today. Um, I know that states are beginning to reopen after three long, more than three long months, but I promise you that people who are dealing with cancer or any other illness that may make them immunocompromised are going to be the last to leave their homes. And they're already feeling more isolated than most of us are during this pandemic and perhaps are more scared um, of the consequences of catching something like this. So your support, whether it's spiritual guidance, social, uh, you know, psychosocial support, helping someone with, get the meals they need or, or something, or just a friendly voice to talk to is more important now than it ever has been. And it's always been quite important. So we consider these people, um, an integral member of the treatment team, which doesn't just consist of a doctor, a surgeon, uh, you know, but also a social worker, a clergy member, a best friend, a community professional, because all of these people help get someone through the cancer experience. Okay, so, you know, as we're talking about co cultural nuances, there are a lot of things in every culture that might impact a diagnosis, treatment, survivorship. Uh, a couple of examples in the Jewish community I'll share with you. Um, you know, it's interesting. The first one, the one that I really wanna focus on here is tattooing. And the reason I'm focusing on this is because it doesn't matter where someone falls in the spectrum of Jewish observance. Um, everybody seems to have learned the, the myth the Bubba Mainza, that you can't be buried in a Jewish cemetery if you have tattoos. Well, tattoos are part of radiation therapy. You can see in the picture, this woman's torso, she's pointing to a spot that's a little bluer than the two beauty marks lower on her torso. Those are what the, the guiding tattoos look like to ensure that the radiation only hits where we want it to hit because in addition to helping cure cancer, radiation of, of course ca can cause cancer. So it's, it's a, usually about five tiny dots, but for some people, the, the prospect of needing to be tattooed in any way is horrifying. And um, so interestingly enough, if you know that someone might have a concern about that, um, it's important to take that into consideration. What we find is that people do have, who do have that concern don't talk to their healthcare team or their, their, their treatment team about it because they don't want to seem backward or provincial. But they also don't talk to their, their rabbis about it because they don't want to seem uneducated. So often the fear just, or the concern just hovers there without, um, without it being resolved. So when we talk to social workers, to oncologists, to radiation therapists, we let them know that this may be a concern and whether the person just heard that myth or it's for um, religious law or it's cult it feels culturally inappropriate because their grandparents may have been tattooed during the Holocaust against their will, we can find a way around it. So we, we educate all of these, these cancer care team members about this and they can say something as simple as, you know, I, I, I once had a patient who had this concern. If they have a, a, a patient, a client, who went through surgery, who went through chemotherapy, and they're putting the brakes on now with radiation, like it's up to that person to try and figure out why the brakes are there. Does the person need a physical break, an emotional break? Uh, is, it, uh, is it something cultural? So tattooing is a pretty good example. There are plenty of other examples outside of um, 
uh, of the Jewish community of where someone might need culturally specific support. Right, uh, we know that members of the LGBT community very often don't um, receive some standard care or standard of care or are hesitant to go to the doctor because they feel they'll be judged. Um, we know that there are other communities where um, where it's completely taboo, also in parts of the Jewish community, to talk about cancer. Um, where we know in some communities the women don't speak to the doctors, it's the men that help to make the decisions, the spouses, the partners. Um, so there are a lot of different nuances. And what I always say is if you're working with someone new as a, a counselor, a therapist in a different capacity, um, then and, and someone new and you're not familiar with the culture, it, it would behoove uh, all of us as professionals to do a little research, get a connection in the community, to learn some basics, and be honest, you know? And I'll share some, uh, some words uh, in a few slides about how to be honest with the client um, and get them to be a part of your learning process. We also work with end-of-life con concerns and decisions for those who have exhausted all treatment options. And we know that preparation for death is very different in every community. And so that's an important thing to keep in mind if that's something you're helping a client with. Okay, as I finish up this particular section, I want to talk to you for a second about this slide. Of course, at the beginning, I showed you a slide of many different ways to be Jewish and, and talked about how people can be Jewish and have different needs based on their Judaism. But now I'm going to complicate it and remind you that none of your clients, none of your members are single, you know, are just anything, are just Jewish. Everybody is multidimensional. So here you have examples on the screen. Somebody could be Jewish and older or Jewish and younger. Someone could be a Jew of color, a Jew with a physical disability, a Jew in a same-sex relationship, and you could replace the word Jew with anything else here as well, any other culture. And so you, it might help be helping someone meet their, their Jewish and cultural needs um, during a cancer experience, but you, they'll likely have other needs based on their own life experience that they may need help with as well. Okay, Lisa, let's take a break now before I go into a little bit about Sharsheret and see if there are any questions about anything I've spoken about so far. And if you haven't had a chance to type into the, the chat bar or the chat room and you wanna unmute yourself for a second, that is fine as well. Okay. Um. No, I don't see anyone asking any questions. You have been very explicit, I'll tell you that. Uh, <laughs> so it's, been, it's been great, very interesting. It's a lot of information and it's right. a new topic. I very often find, and I'll put this out there, that people have questions a day later or a week later or when they're working with their first patient or first client on this topic. Um, and then please, please don't hesitate to reach out. My email will be at the end of the slides and and um, happy to answer any questions a week from now, a year from now, absolutely. Okay, Okay. so people are here, right? <laughs> it's hard to tell because I don't see anyone's faces. Right, because the slides so, are up. I'm sure right. people are there. No, I, I'm, I have it in the um, other view so I could see if anyone is interested in. Uh, I see the participants questions. just came up. We still have the same amount of participants we started with, so we're good. Naomi's here. Carol's here. Okay, terrific. We got some people. <laughs> no, Great. We're, Thank we're you. Good. We're good. Thumbs up. We're Keep on going. So okay, last, thanks for letting me know. <laughs> the last part of, the, of today's presentation is about Sharsheret and how um, Sharsheret can help women in your community, women and families in your community, and can help you help women and families in your community. So we'll talk a little bit about what Char Sharon has to offer and a little bit about how we can work together to raise awareness and save lives and offer support and better lives. I just got a flashing chat. So maybe there is a question, flashing chat notification. Um, if there is, just inter interrupt me, Lisa. But let me start um, by telling you that 
everything that Charcheret offers, all support services are 100% individualized based on the person's specific needs, the, call, the caller's specific needs, 100% confidential, and actually could be anonymous as well. We have many, many callers who have created um, Gmail accounts and fake names are just given us their initials and um, for, for a variety of reasons and can receive help that way. And 100% free. We want to ensure that the barriers for receiving psychosocial support during a cancer experience are as low as possible. Okay, so the way to think of Charcheret is two teams. We have an outreach and education team, and I'll talk about those in a little bit. We also have a clinical team, an amazing top-notch team of social workers, a genetic counselor, who take calls all day, nine to five in every time zone. So that means you could, if you live in California, you could even call someone before work. If you live in New York, you could call someone after work. And uh, they take calls, like I said, all day. Sometimes they're as simple as, um, I, I'm about to start chemo, here's my zip code, where can I find a low cost wig? And oftentimes they're as complicated as, I just got off the phone with my oncologist, the biopsy was, conclusive and now I need to start th thinking about treatment and frankly I'm overwhelmed. Can you help me sort things out? And very often um, our callers develop ongoing relationships with our clinicians, not just um, through their cancer experience but years beyond. Um, and so, so that's in, important to keep in mind. But in addition to that service of talking to um, a clinician, we also offer formal programs that help navigate a family through a breast or ovarian cancer experience. Um, and I'm gonna share some examples here. So we have a peer support network. I love the way we connect peer supporters because it's different than any other organization that I have heard of. Um, we connect them based on exact diagnosis. Breast cancer alone is 11 distinct diagnoses stage of life because your cancer experience will be um, very different if you um, are single, if you're an empty nester, if you have rambunctious toddlers or surly teenagers in your house, and also if relevant, um, your relationship to Judaism. Again, only if relevant. And sometimes um, in addition to the more traditional peer support where they just are in touch on a regular basis, we'll connect people based on questions they have. Somebody might be considering using a cold cap, which is something you wear during the chemotherapy process that helps reduce hair loss. And, and so we'll connect them with someone who's used a, a cold cap just to hear their experience. We have a genetics for life program. It's a great program that does everything from um, help people decide um, when the right time is for genetic screening to family conference calls to explain the implications of the results after. It's also um, usually when you speak to a genetic counselor, you go into a hospital um, where their office is or their offices frequently are. And for someone who's a little nervous to take that step, this is a great, um, a great way to dip a toe in. We have a program that's specific for the needs of women facing ovarian cancer. Our EMBRACE program is for women who are living with, who are dealing with a permanent relationship with cancer. They have metastatic breast cancer or advanced ovarian cancer. And this program includes free weekly counseling with a specific um, clinician in our, on our team. It includes a, a private but monitored Facebook group just for people in the EMBRACE program who are dealing with, um, with um, late stage cancer. Uh, it includes webinars just for them about how to live well with cancer because uh, metastatic disease has changed quite a bit and um, for some they could live decades with it. So we don't want people to put their lives on hold. We want them to live their lives um, healthfully, joyously, but with alongside cancer. And so we have a wonderful program for that. Our Busy Box program, one of my favorites. For women and families who are raising small children, young children, while dealing with cancer, the children get a huge box of toys addressed to them, age appropriate, interest appropriate. We find out 
whether your children are readers or sports fanatics uh, or artists and put that information in. And then under all, excuse me, put those toys in. Under all of those toys is a sealed package filled with information for the adults in the household on how to talk to your children in a developmentally appropriate way about cancer. Our family focus is for caregivers. Again, I'm going to re-emphasize not just spouses or partners, but adult children, teen children, uh, parents, friends, in some cases, colleagues. Not only will we talk to provide you an opportunity to vent yourself without burdening your loved one or your friend, but also talk about concrete ways to, to help that person. Our Best Face Forward program helps women who are dealing with the cosmetic side effects of treatment. It's a free kit, just like all of this is free. It's a free kit filled with paraben free makeup and lotions, brow guides, instructions on how to, to use it all. And we have amazing partnerships um, with Sephora and cosmetics um, with really wonderful products. Our Thriving Again Kit was actually, um, was actually created in collaboration with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention with the CDC. And it is all about moving beyond the initial diagnosis healthfully, both physically and emotionally. So it comes standard with a lot of healthy living resources. And the, the person who orders it can customize it based on their concerns. They can choose for us to add extra information about fertility or exercise or, or talking to children or fear of reoccurrence or celebrating Jewish holidays. There are about 20 topics they can choose from. Two of them have Jewish content in them. Um, the rest are for anyone who's, been, who's faced a diagnosis. And it comes with a gorgeous cookbook as well. We have three versions of this kit, breast cancer, ovarian cancer, and metastatic disease. We have a new program that we launched this year. It's actually very exciting and I'm, I'm thrilled to be able to share it with you. We, I talked about Best Face Forward. Well, this is BFF 2.0. This is the first time Sharsheret has offered need-based financial subsidies for women to take care of some of their non-medical needs. So for us, and as related to BFF, um, this is what it might cover. It might cover the purchase of a wig might cover, I talked about cold caps. You can see a picture here of someone wearing it. It's um, a very expensive endeavor. Um, and um, whether you have insurance or not, we can help cover the cost of that. And it might cover what, what is known formally as three-dimensional micropigmentation, which is really the end of breast reconstruction. And it's um, nipple and areola tattooing. We also have um, meditation and yoga um, resources as part of this. And I say it's need-based, um, but I just want to say that like our services in general, we've set the, the bar very low. Um, we really try to provide everyone um, who, who applies for this some sort of subsidy. And by the way, we have a staff member, one of my colleagues, who takes the person applying and holds her hand throughout the entire process so that it is as easy as possible. You know, while you read the slide, which is just a social media um, message we got about how the best, how BusyBox helps someone, I just wanna reiterate that um, in addition to all of these formal programs and access to our clinicians at any point, Sharsheret has, in the last three months, um, began creating approximately two webinars a week. One that is always a cancer and COVID update, um, and one that offers some form of psychosocial support. So as isolation has increased for all of us, but particularly those dealing with a cancer experience, we're providing additional ways to connect. Um, and no matter the topic, I, we've noticed that the chat boxes always fill a pe filled with people supporting one another, which is a wonderful thing to, um, to see and, and, and to witness. Um, we have actually next week, we just had last week one on 
loosening the sense of uh, the sense of quarantine and and how that um, what we should think about as cancer survivors. And we have one next week. Um, we're doing in in collaboration with Sephora stands on um, a, and it's a tutorial on how to use. Um, makeup uh, to reduce the cosmetic side effects of treatment. So you can go out feeling confident. Um, and that's, that's um, just the two that I can think of off the top of my head. You can always go onto our website. There's a sec special section for COVID resources that you'll see on our homepage and it will link you to not only all upcoming webinars for not only yourselves, but for really the members of your community but also um, recordings of past ones, if ones are of interest to someone you know. So in addition to uh, what we offer to those who are impacted directly or indirectly by cancer, we offer educational programs to communities at large. And we do this with many of you who are on this webinar today, which is very exciting. We offer um, for different forms of support and help, and, and help you offer different forms of support for those are it, who are impacted. But we also provide educational resources, which I know many of you have in your waiting rooms or in your lobbies or in your desk to, um, to distribute as appropriate. We do patient education programs. So when working with um, J, uh, JFSs and, and cancer support organizations, we may zoom in or if it's close to one of our travel destinations as we travel for sure Sherrod and hopefully we'll start again soon, um, even in person things um, that, that are of interest to those impacted in the community. And we do symposia, not just the two a week, um, that I've been talking about, but we do three major ones a year that are actually specifically designed, not just for those impacted, but for those working with um, those impacted and for, for as in social workers or community professionals or um, doctors, healthcare professionals. I also, I just want to take a few moments to talk about um, how we might work together to educate your community, save lives by raising awareness, and to make the lives of those impacted better. So for some partners, as I mentioned, our community partners are a wide range from synagogues to family services to JCCs to cancer support organizations and, and beyond. Um, and every partner works with us differently. Um, and for some, they want to do support. Um, very often um, they'll choose either a, a traditional process-based support group or um, even more often recently, um, experiential support group where groups of people impacted get together and do things that contribute to healthy living. Whether it's you know, somebody leading a yoga class or somebody coming in and doing a cooking demonstration on healthy, you know, a healthy eating recipe whether they go out together and walk or pack bags to deliver for um, meals on wheels to give back to the community, whatever it is. And then the support sort of builds informally as opposed to how it would in a more traditional support group. For some of our, our partners and the community organizations we work with, clinical doesn't make sense and they want to do educational programming. Whether it's educational lectures, um, healthy living programs, or for those, um, you know, in the Jewish community, Sharsheret Pink Shabbat programs, um, healthy lectures, or any of these, any of these programs could actually be on a variety of topics, whether it's what's Jewish about breast cancer, whether it's hereditary genetics and cancer, whether it's how to best support someone facing an illness or how to create, how to ensure your community is a caring community. So we can do those separately, one-on-one -on -one support or communal support, or we can even do those together. We can talk about um, proactive healthy living, any number of topics that are related. 
we've actually just completed creating a new set of educational mod modules that were created specifically to be done either in person or just as well over Zoom as people move into um, the, the summer and breast and ovarian cancer awareness months in September and October. Um, and those modules are something I will share, but we created a new module specifically on healing because there hasn't been a time in, in recent memory where our general community is in need of, of healing, both individually and communally. So there'll be a whole list of new resources that Char Sherrod is pushing out that can, that can help that, that uh, agenda in each of our individual communities. And then finally, some of our, our partners, some of the organizations we work with, do more outreach in general. They'll help us by connecting us to local congregations or local health clinics or cancer centers. Um, they'll help us by um, publishing op-eds or soliciting articles during Breast Cancer Awareness Month or by just sharing ed our educational resources. So there are a lot of ways that we partner with organizations such as yours. Let me take a second. I had promised you that I would share the right language. Um, and again, it's important to keep in mind that it's not always comfortable to talk about these topics. Listen, if you are, um, if you're a social worker at a JFS and somebody's coming to you for counseling to, to kind of work through their cancer experience, it may be a little bit easier. It, it feels like you've been granted permission to talk about it. Um, but there may be still topics that are difficult to bring up. But what if you work at a different type of organization, a JCC or something, or a synagogue, and you see, you happen to know someone is dealing with a diagnosis. And of course, I'm talking about a breast cancer diagnosis, but it could be any diagnosis. And you see that that person could use some support. But how do you bring that to them without feeling like you're being intrusive? So the first two of these really are for people who are working with genetics or in the healthcare field, but the second two are really important. You can simply say, you know, I, I heard that you are dealing with, with this diagnosis right now. I once knew someone or I once had a client, depending on your relationship with them. And then the dot, dot, dot is you fill in the blanks. I once knew someone who really was struggling to, uh, with childcare during her experience. Can we help you with that? You know, we have daycare here. Maybe we can help with that. Or um, our, the teens that we work with are, are looking to volunteer and might be able to give you your kids some homework help. Or I once had a client who was really afraid to talk about this and I want you to know I'm here to listen. I'm here to help, whatever it is. And then this last bullet here, I think is so important. And this is a very general um, statement and you'll have to tailor it to your relationship. But just saying, is there anything you can think of that you're dealing with right now that might interfere with what you're dealing with? You know, you could say if it's a more formal relationship treatment plan, but you could just say that might interfere with, you know, getting everything done you need to do or dealing with your cancer diagnosis might be work, it might be religious life, it might be family concerns. But by saying this, you are letting that person, whatever your relationship with is to that person, know that you are there for them, you are open to hearing about different things and helping in different ways, and that you understand there are challenges coming in the, in the, you know, in the coming months, that there will be challenges and you are there for them. And that is such a gift. It doesn't let you off the hook afterward, you know, still check in and things like that, but it, it's a gift to give that person permission to talk about things. I want to say that as we're looking to wrap up in, a, in the next few minutes, perhaps 10 minutes, um, I want to say that um, one of the questions I often get is you know we are so busy right now and of course in the current situation i mean it's always an issue of finances but in the current situation so much more so 
like, why should we take on this? Like, there are hospitals that are offering these kind of services, or, you know, somebody can get a private therapist or whatever it is. So there are several reasons to consider adding this to your agenda as something very, very important. You know, first of all, it's not so easy to find someone who does um, cancer counseling. And very often um, for JFSs, um, they may be looking to, um, to recruit or entice um, additional counseling patients. And we can send you, as you, you're a participant here, um, our, our statement that says you've been trained to be able to do this and you can push that forward and it may, may well be a way to bring in additional counseling people. For, for people who don't work in that sort of clinical setting, I just want to point out that when, when, when we talk about inclusion, we very often are thinking about people who have physical disabilities or, or things like that. People who are facing illness like that, we need to think about that as inclusion as well. And when we work to meet the needs of those facing illness, we are strengthening our community dramatically. Um, we, we really are, the, the studies have shown that, that offering support for, to someone, physical and, and emotional support to someone, actually tightens the relationship between the person offering support and the person receiving support to the organization it's coming through. It so as an example, a cancer support community, a synagogue, a JCC, something like that, both the recipient and the giver who are, who are involved in this support now feel closer to your organization because the support came through it. And that's really very important. And of course, it is just a good value to have, um, to have it. And, and, and then if, for those who are talking about education and awareness as opposed to support, whether formally, professionally, or just through as, a, as community members, um, for those who are talking about outreach and education, um, you know, for those in a Jewish setting, the information that people, people receive um, on the news, online, about cancer risk might not be true for our community. And so we need to educate them differently. And it is certainly a Jewish value to care for our bodies. And, um, and so this could be considered easily an obligation to, to educate. And I know that it has saved lives. Um, I've heard the stories of people who have gone to one of our events or one of our partner events. They schedule the mammogram they shouldn't they should have scheduled months ago and and they find a diagnosis um, earlier than they would have had they not learned this or they get screening and they find out they're brca positive and they take action um, okay before i finish with my last few slides about resources specifically for you <clears throat> lisa this might be a good time to see if there are any other questions Yes, there are actually some questions. And um, I just want to say before we begin that I remember when Sharshara just began, you guys have come a long <laughs> way, baby. I'm not kidding. You have such great support and educational programs. It's super impressive. So uh, that's what I wanted to say. Um, I've been in the field for uh, 30 years as well. So um, great work. Okay, here are the questions. Um, where does your funding come from for Sharshara? It's a great question. So we have three main sources of funding. The first is our collaborative agreements with the CDC. We um, are in the middle of our third. Um, in the past, it's been to develop our Thriving Again kit. It's been to amplify our and strengthen our programs, things like that. Um, and um, so that is definitely, we're very grateful for that partnership. Certainly we get money from both like private foundations, but also pharmacy, pharmaceutical foundations, um, which to clarify does not mean we're supporting any sort of medical or specific drug treatment or specific drug. Um, pharmaceutical companies need to, to um, contribute to these as part of the rules they abide by to support organizations. So we are in partnership with many uh, of those companies and of course, individual donations always. Terrific. 
Um, next thing, what do you do at Charchera if the cancer patient is not interested in help from, from Charchera, but a family member or friend feels that it's important? That is actually a fabulous question. Um, I'm going to give two pieces of advice or one. First, let me just say that the first times um, we are approached for somewhat to help someone is very often not by the individual who's going through the diagnostic process, but for by someone who is helping them, a parent, a spouse, a friend saying, my friend is, is overwhelmed. She's going through this now. Can you share with me? some things she should be thinking about that I'll pass on to her? Or can you send um, a packet of information that I'll pass on to her? Um, and then when things calm down a little bit, very often we're able to be in touch with that person. Um, by the way, the last few slides include several ways to connect people. So that'll provide you with additional resources. The other thing is sometimes, um, whether it's because a person is overwhelmed or because it's hard to ask for help or because, and we hear this a lot, oh, I wanna save the resources for people who really need them. Okay, let me just be clear, your, wherever you fall in, you know, on the economic spectrum, wherever you fall on the emotional spectrum, wherever you fall on the diagnostic spectrum, we are here for you. Our programs are not tied to, you know, we're not only going to take people who needed chemotherapy. I've often heard, you know, I didn't, I didn't need chemotherapy, so it didn't feel like a real cancer diagnosis. Or I only have a BRCA mutation, like save it for people who really need it. Those are not legitimate excuses in George Sherrod's book. Um, and, and, but for people who can't reach out to us or can't accept for whatever reason, we often find different programs that are easier to accept. So for instance, if a person feels she's fine and she doesn't need our help, somebody might say to her, you know, they have a busy box program. Why not get your kids some great toys to keep them busy? And it happens to have some information about how to talk to your children in a, in a way. And I find, I've never found someone who said, you know what, I don't need help and my, neither do my kids. They'll very often say, oh, you know what, that'll do. And then when, when our staff member reaches out to find out whether we should include art supplies or comic books or, you know, whatever it is, we'll say, by the way, you know, here are some of our other programs we might be able to help you with. And so that's kind of a back way in, but a way that people often feel more comfortable accepting help. Absolutely. So two people wrote that they would like to uh, learn how to connect and offer partnerships and what's the best way to do that. But I figure you'll say that at the end. I am going to say okay. a little bit at the end on that, and after, okay. I'm thrilled to hear it. Okay, so we just wanted to let you know. And then we have another question. Is BRCA testing for mutations part of the standard panel of genetic testing, or do people actually need to ask for it as a specific additional test? This, that's also a great question. So first of all, we've often heard from people like, oh, I had genetic screening before I was married or while I was pregnant. They would have told me if I was BRCA positive. It is a completely different screening that needs to happen separately. Um, what I will tell you is there are two ways to do it. You can get BRCA screening, which really just tests for the three primary most common mutations, which are called founder mutations within the Ashkenazi community. But there's also a larger panel. So, and that tests for depending on what, what lab someone goes through, could be 50 different mutations, could be hundreds. Um, and so, if, and there are different reasons for taking different, different ones of those. Um, it used to be purely economic. You could get BRC at a reason, screening is at a reasonable price, but when you added, it was much more expensive. That is not the case anymore. So the person needs to talk to a genetic counselor who needs to talk to a doctor to see. Um, if they're specifically looking for a BRCA mutation that they know was carried in their family, then maybe they only need that but more often than not, people are getting full panels now. Okay, thank you. Um, hopefully that answered your question. Um, someone wrote earlier uh, to talk a little bit, and maybe I missed it, but um, to talk a little bit about the relevance of family, of family purity laws. 
Ah, okay. So yes, that is definitely something we can talk about. Um, I do a whole other presentation about that. And whoever asked the question, when I email you later with some additional resources, you can write back and I can send you some information. But basically, for those who immerse in a ritual mikvah bath um, on a monthly basis, uh, coordinated with their menses, um, cancer treatment can actually really mess with one cycle. A lot of it is hormonally based. And so, of course, that does mess with the cycle. And so someone might be constantly spotting, so unable to go the re requisite number of days without that before immersing. Or someone might um, be getting, not getting their period when they think they should be, or, or are suddenly finding themselves not having to go to the mikvah when they didn't even realize it might be their last time. The reason that this matters is because if you immerse for religious reasons, um, it means that you're not touching your partner in between, like in between the end of a menses and, and, and ritual immersion. The problem with that is that not only does that not mean you can't be physically intimate, um, but it also means the following. It means that your partner can't hold your hand as you're getting your blood drawn and you're afraid. It means your partner can't hold your hair back when you're, you're violently ill after your chemotherapy. It means your partner can't give you a hug as you leave the oncologist's office to find out that you're NED, that you have no evidence of disease in your body. And so at a time that a person is already feeling emotionally isolated, physically isolated, and we know that physical touch helps healing across the board, it means there's no option for that for some people. And so how do we get around that? And get around, it's really the wrong way to say it. Um, we work with doctors, we work with rabbis, and there are different decisions that can be made. So for instance, if a doctor is choosing a pick line, which actually is um, um, something that sticks out of you and would make it possibly dangerous to immerse, and they're only choosing a pick line because it's a less invasive treatment than getting a port, which is something that lives under your skin and is a surgical, like an, a, a surgical procedure, then maybe a, a port is more important to you, even though it means an extra surgical procedure. I have worked with rabbis who have made calls all, all night long to find a rabbinic source so that someone can immerse. Um, I've also worked with mikvahs mikvah oat across the country, where in some cases um, they've drained the pool at the end of the day, scrubbed it for someone who's very immunocompromised and refilled it, and then had that person immerse the first, for the first time uh, the, for the, for, as the first immersion the next day. And in general, that level of immer uh, cleanliness isn't an issue um, because we know there's, there's, um, there's chlorine in there anyway, but for some people it might be. Um, and there are also people who want to immerse to mark the end of treatment or to celebrate a remission or things like that, which are non-traditional. Um, but for anyone who wants more about that, I have a, a whole hour long presentation about the nuances of that. And I'm happy to discuss or share some print material. We're breaking up on us right now Ooh. at the very end of everything. Can you, is this better? Can you hear me? I can hear you. I can hear you. Don't log off. I can hear you. Um, I don't think that was you, Karen. I think that was Lisa's signal. It can, it's fine. You didn't break up for me. Oh, okay, fine. Okay, so let me keep going, and then Lisa, when she gets back on, can tell can um, can provide tell me if there are any other questions. Let's go to the resources. So we have a lot of resources for you as professionals and for the communities you work with. Um, you can go online and you'll see, you know, under resources or get involved, it'll say, uh, you know, community programming or something like that. And you'll just, you'll go to here, it says free resources. And then you pick what you want. And we have a lot of resources available. You'll see it's free, you just add the number you want. And it gives you an option to download them beforehand. Um, so you can see what you're ordering. Additionally, when I, res when I send a follow-up email to you this afternoon, I'll give you the opportunity to order a, a kit that I can just send you that includes one of everything, so you can see that. 
I promised you oppor different opportunities. Can, every, can somebody just tell me they still hear me? Yep. Okay, great. Um, I promised you different ways to connect your, your clients, the members of your community. So um, very often, as you know, if you work in, in a, any sort of clinical field, we can't reach out to someone. You can't call us and say, I know someone who needs your help, needs your help, here's their number, give them a call. But what you can do is the following. I can send you a, um, a personalized referral form that will say, you know, NJHSA, or I, I know that the LAJFS is on, I saw, so it would say that or whatever it is. And if you email this to us, we can then reach out because it provides that person's permission. If you're not talking face to face, you can sign their name with their permission as long as you note it's by proxy with permission, and then we can reach out. We also have a new form that you can keep in your office, and it, it it's just the person's information. They can check whatever top, whatever resource they're interested in and pop it in the mail. And then when we get it, we'll reach out to them. And then finally, for some people, like you can just say, call or share, here's their email or here's their telephone number or here's their website, and they can do that. So there are a lot of options. As we really finish, and this is great because we're right on time, uh, just a couple of things to talk about. One is, is there a place in your office or in your center that some of the more general resources, signs and symptoms, what's Jewish about breast cancer can be uh, displayed? I'm willing to bet that in every community represented here today, there is someone who you know who could already benefit from our resources and our support. I'd like for you not to answer now, but to give some thought. Is there one thing you can implement that would benefit your membership, your community, your clients? And then where might it make sense for an awareness or support program to live in your organization? Um, would it be a caring community committee at a synagogue, health and wellness or adult education in a JCC? Would it be you know, in the, within the clinical department at a JFS? There are a lot of different options. And in terms of um, how to connect with me to hear more about partnership, which I want to be clear, we have um, a couple of hundred community partners across the country. There's no fee to be a partner. Everyone will, will, will work with individually to um, meet the needs of your community. Just respond to my, my email that I'm about to send out, or here's my email here, mrosen at charsherit.org. As we finish up, Alisa, can you see if there are any more questions? And if not, please finish up with the last slide. Okay, thank you so much, Melissa. I do not see um, any more questions, but again, Melissa is available and the slide deck um, and some, the recording will be available on the website for NJHSA members. Um, we have a couple of more upcoming webinars that are part of the Vision Vision 2020 um, conference that was supposed to happen in Dallas. We have next week the uh, plenary on poverty in the U.S. and the implications of COVID-19, uh, which is sponsored by Mutual of America. And on June 17th, we have Vision uh, Sprint or Marathon for the Claims Conference. Um, again, I want to thank Melissa on behalf of the network, um, and thank you for being a partner with the network. Our pleasure. All right. Thank you very much, everyone, and I hope I'll be in touch with all of you at some point.